Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Beyond the Track with Daniel Blair. Thanks for tuning in. This is going to be a good one. Uh, I say that all the time because they're all good. Maybe this one will be great because of the guest. Uh, Jason Thomas is on. JT, timing is everything. I've wanted you on now for a few months, but I think the timing is uh, perfect for this one. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, we're in a very seasonal business. And honestly, from COVID, we haven't had a lot to sell, which is a a crazy thing for fly racing to say. Um, but we are now in our, our 2022 selling season. We have all the stuff that came out at the Washougal National a couple weeks ago. So yeah, we're we're prime time and happy to actually be able to uh, to get stuff onto riders and, and tell our story. Yeah, I, we're going to get into all that. I want to touch on uh, your involvement with fly and obviously the launch that just happened. Um, I want to get into some of the media things that you're doing, obviously still writing articles, which I don't know if you watched the one I did with Steve Mathis, but I, you, you guys that continue to write articles are crazy. I can't put one sentence down on paper anymore. It's like my hand forgot how to write <laughs> or type because we don't yeah. write. I, 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 I doubt you write anything, right? <laughs> Do yeah, you write I, I write it all in uh, <laughs> penmanship and then I scan it over to Racer X. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's how I thought we did it these days. Um, but you know, JT, I actually want to focus on things that I don't know about you because I would consider us friends. Is that is that fair? Are we uh, friends? You might be taking some liberties, but I'm gonna allow it. Okay, like low level for like diet friends, acquaintances. <laughs> huh. There's a big leap from acquaintance to friend. Industry, I felt like industry I was... contact. Oh God, that's brutal. That's a that's a right now with that but anyway I got things I want to ask you about because I things I don't know and I'm assuming a lot of people watching know about your media um, credentials what you're doing in the podcast world and what you're doing at fly but I want to talk about well I want to start with a young JT in Florida what was that guy like take me back to those early days grow up in Florida just getting started in the sport well so my my dad raced right so I don't really remember a time when I wasn't around supercross motocross um my mom worked for the AMA at several of the races too so my earliest memories of that are actually being at the track being on the track during supercross races and behind the scenes at pro motocross races so I had a very I think unique experience where yes I was a fan yes I was watching the races but I was also in the midst of this stuff. You know, I was at sign up talking like as a little kid talking to Jeff Stanton and Rick Johnson and these guys that they were my heroes, but I had this really uh, kind of exclusive access um, that was just happenstance for me. I didn't do anything to earn that access. Uh, but yeah, that was my earliest memories were being right in the midst of it. Uh, and of course I rode and my dad rode, but all that stuff was for fun, you know, going to school. And I played other sports too, played baseball, football. I loved all those sports. So racing and dirt bikes were kind of mixed into that. Um, it wasn't, you know, an all in motocross experience for me, as far as my participation until I got a little bit older. And I realized that, you know, the pitchers in baseball were throwing a little bit faster than I necessarily wanted to be standing in the batter's box for. And, you know, I'm a, a smaller guy. So football practice was starting to get a little bit painful. I was getting run over by, <laughs> you know, 16 year olds that were six, three and, and 300 hey, so pounds. Did, did the rude awakening that an NFL career was not in the cards, <laughs> did that hit hard? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. So when I was in junior high, I, I was good at baseball. Um, I actually had some talent for it. And I remember my junior high coach who is now a legendary baseball coach at the high school I went to. Uh, he's actually retiring after like 30 years. I remember him sitting down with me and saying, Hey, like you're, you're pretty good baseball player, but your size is always going to be a limiting factor for you. And, and I just want to be very, very upfront with you because you're going to be disappointed later because you're going to be wondering <laughs> why aren't any colleges looking at me? And it's just going to be a size thing. They're going to disqualify you right out of the gate. So I remember that I was like 12 years old and I remember, okay, I need to find something where size isn't going to matter, right? If I'm good at it and I'm willing to put in the, the effort and the work ethic towards it, then that can be rewarded. And I won't have these barriers just because of something I can't control. Uh, so from that day forward, it was like, okay, I'm going racing. And then yeah, sky's the limit. O only I'm going to hold myself back, not someone else's decision. So again, you're tying in a couple of things. So you're, you're around the track, you're at the Supercrosses, Stanton, Johnson, 
Um, you're finding out that the sizing is going to hold you back from sticking ball sports. Are you looking at Jeff Ward going, uh huh? <laughs> you know, I at the time, this. I'm going into this. I'm right. going into this. At the time, I really wasn't. Um, but I think if you look back now and you look at guys like Carmichael and Jeff Ward and guys like Villapoto and these guys, I would bet they were pretty talented because their coordination is so high. But at the same time, you start limiting the amount of avenues you can go down. And uh, so, yeah, I, I didn't really correlate it back then, but in hindsight, absolutely. I'm sure there are other guys like RJ Hampshire, perfect example, right? He's not a really big guy. He's probably 5'10", 5'9". And to be to make it in, in baseball, you need to be six foot. You need to be 200 plus pounds for the just just that those stats that they want. Yeah. They want that that height and weight to even take you to the next level. So for a guy like that who was really talented at baseball, I think he had to probably look at that at some level and say, okay, I'm going to go do something where yeah, I can I can take it all the way, and, and none of that's going to yeah. matter. I mean, think about the, the decision there. I don't, I don't know what the decision is going to be on the motocross of nations, but RJ's in that conversation. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a guy who could potentially represent the country at the biggest dirt bike race in the world versus maybe being amazing at baseball, like you said. But if there's people that are six foot that have the equal skill set, he won't get that call. Had to make that pivot over. And now you're going to represent the country, possibly. I mean, yeah, and you, you good decision. About <laughs> right. Yeah. You think about some of the days this year uh, where RJ was absolutely the best 250 racer in America on that day, this, this Lucas oil promoter cross season yeah. in baseball, he probably would have never been able to say that ever. Like that's just not something that would be possible. So of course he made the right decision, but it's just funny how something that's completely out of your control can really dictate, you know, your destiny when there's that fork in the road, you have to decide between. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, it seems like for every kid at some point they become, they go from a fan to like, I want to be that guy. Like I want to make it, I want to make it. You know what I mean? There's that transition. Everyone, some kids do it at six, some kids do it at 16. It just depends. Is that that time period for you is into those junior high, you know, early teen years where you're like, okay, I no longer, I'm just going to be a fan. Like I actually want to be one of these guys. I want to try to be one of them. Is that the time period? You know, I wanted to be them. Yeah, it's for as long as I can remember that that was never in question. Uh, but, you know, I think I, when I was around 15, 16, I started doing a little better. I was winning a lot of regional events. I was competing. I was like a top five national caliber guy in, in the intermediate classes. And I think I started to realize that there was a chance. I mean, there was nothing certain, of course, but I realized, okay, I'm not terrible at this because in my younger days, I wasn't very good. So I was like, yeah, this is never going to work. But I started uh, getting better quickly and my my growth and acceleration curve started to ramp up pretty steeply and i remember very vividly talking with my dad we were driving back from some amateur race who knows right you spend so much time with your families driving around the country to these races and i remember telling my dad i was like i don't think i can ever be jeremy mcgrath or jeff emig or those guys i, I just think the talent gap is too big i think ricky carmichael who i was the same age as right i raced in my entire life i think he will be that but if I could just make it to the level of a Todd to hoop or someone in that middling group where they hover around inside the top 10, you know, they're always in the main events. They're always, you know, they're getting in magazines. I think if I could get to that level, that would be a success. Like that was really what I was aiming for just because I was, I was very analytical to it. And I, I was always assessing talent and like what my ceiling was based off of where I was in the moment. And there were just so many guys that were so much better than I was at the time. I'm like, I just don't know that I can ever catch up to that. Like they're just too gifted. doesn't matter how much work I put in. I don't think I can get there. Um, so yeah, that, that was really the moment for me. I was like, okay, I'm good enough. I think I can go pro. And that's really my goal is to be one of those guys. Like you're in the pits, like you're known, you have a ride. And I think I accomplished that, which is cool looking back. But I remember that conversation very, very well. It was like, that's where I want to aspire to. Like that, I think that's my ceiling. And yeah, it's, so in that aspect, it's really cool to, I, I think I attained that goal. So you thought possibly could get to the point where you have a national number in the 30s forever. <laughs> yeah, just year in and year out. Just stamp it. I'll just, I, I'll just I, hang I, there. I was thinking this, because we're in episode 50 something. And I'm like, man, we really blew it. 
We could have had you on any of the episode 30 to 39, and it would have been probably three years of your racing career yeah. to match up. But, dude, I, I mean, we're, we're going to skip forward through the end of amateurs into the pros. That's when I became familiar with who you are. But, yeah, year after year of just, like, rock results, always in the 30s. Did you consider that? to be a success, proud, happy to be there? Was there aspirations for better than that? I mean, just kind of take me through all those years where you were right there. I mean, dude, you were like the most consistent human being on the planet. So was that good for you? Or did you feel like you maybe wanted more? You know, I felt like it was pretty good because if you really look at it, uh, the way that the national number system works, it's not necessarily that I was in the 30s as far as ranking. Uh, we had this permanent system where there were a lot of guys I was finishing ahead of year in and year out for total points, but they had their permanent number. So I automatically was placed behind them. Uh, and there were several years, the 2005, 2006, 2007, even 08 years, 04, 03 as well, where I was in the teens. I just never got into that top 10 where I got to choose a number. So I think that was a bummer at the time. I remember being bummed at the time when my number would come out because I would be 31. But realistically, I was like 13. Right. So in my childhood mind, thinking back, if I was number 13, man, that's huge. That would have been a lifetime memory for me to have a number that low. But then again, like a, a kid standing along the fence is just seeing a 31 or a 32 or a 33. And they're not understanding that correlation. Um, so yeah, of course, there's nothing you can do about it. You understand at the time. But man, just thinking back, if that permanent system wasn't in place to have a number that low, that would have been, that would have been a really cool feeling. Um, yeah, I, I never got it, but I knew I earned it. I, so that was really important for me to, uh, I knew in, in my heart that I earned that number to be whatever, 13, 14, 15, something like that. JT, you just needed that one year like Chiz had. You just needed one year to get over the hump and get that permanent number because he's the same type of racer. Just saw, he's such a rock, consistent. But he had that one year where he broke the top 10 and got to go permanent. And how he's still rocking 11, just, just keeping, yeah. it, keeping it strong. And those things are earned, right? You look at uh, a guy like Chisholm's results over the years. I remember there were Supercrosses where he was, you know, five, six, seven, and solidly there. Um, I can remember 2010 Vegas, he, get, he gets fifth in the race, and he earned it, every ounce of that fifth place. So I don't it, – it is a bummer I never got up there, but I also know that those things aren't handed out. Those, those permanent numbers are earned every step of the way over the course of a 29-race season, yeah. right? So um, I, I've seen people take cheap shots at Chisholm with having a permanent number, and I immediately push back against that because I know, I know what it took. Uh, no one handed him that number 11, and he earned that and, and deserves to keep it. So, yep. uh, yeah. I, I agree. I, I, I yeah, just disagree I, with that I, premise entirely. And, and I've seen it. People, they don't, seen they it don't get it. They just don't get it. No, nah, you can't unearn that. He got it. And I'm, I'm with you on that. And JT, as you and I both know, we agree on, I mean, I would say close to everything. We have a couple disagreements that we'll only leave out of this wrong. interview. I only disagree when you, with you when you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have a comeback for that. You, you, you I, you win this, you win this. Uh, I mean, it's a generational I, argument. It's totally it fine. Is, it is. Hey, I just, <laughs> if only we were 17. Um, anyways, uh, I, I do want to go to something that we do agree on because I know throughout your career, you rode a lot of different motorcycles, but I know that there is a certain model that you and I both rode that was just, it was just the magic sauce. Yeah. Uh, take me through those, those oh, six, seven, eight years of the Honda 450 that you and I both rode. I know you had a lot of success on those. I have to imagine those might've been some of the better years of your racing. Yeah. So my favorite all-time motorcycle was the 2005 Honda Sierra 450 and five, 2005, oh, five? yep. 2005. So coming out of the 2004 model, they put the 250 F chassis onto the 450. And it got more nimble. It completely changed everything as far as turning, handling, everything. Uh, and I absolutely loved that motorcycle. 2006 was still great, but they, uh, and we're getting a little technical here, but they, they tilted the, the engine a little bit forward inside the chassis. And it put a little bit more front end pressure on it. And I, that was a, a negative move for me. I think some people liked it. It turned a little better, but it, I felt it, it was a little bit more unbalanced. So I think they took a step back there, but the overall concept of what you're saying, those 05, 6, 7, 8 models were just 
unbelievably great. Uh, and it came at a perfect time for me where my skill set and my age and everything were kind of at a peak. And I was able to make the most of a great time in, in Honda's development process. Uh, and I had great support from Honda. And, you know, I, I switched from the Subway Coca-Cola Honda team over to the Butler Brothers MX team, which is now Rocky Mountain KTM, which most people newer to the sport would, would recognize. Uh, but yeah, as far as a foundational time in my career, I got onto the Honda in 03 and I got off of it in 09 and almost every year, the 09 was a complete disaster, but the <laughs> 03 through 08 <laughs> years so were- That was uh, barely I mean, a dirt bike, man. Totally, was yeah. So bad. But it's funny, it's funny, like when I look back on my career and I talk to people my age or even a little younger, definitely older, and they think about where do they place me? And I, I think as a fan, you always associate a rider with a particular number and a bike and a year. That's what you immediately go to when you think of that person. And that's what it is for most people with me. They think about either Subway Honda or BBMX Honda, but on a Honda, definitely. And some number in the thirties, that's the image that they typically associate. Mine would be a 31. And I'm not sure which team or which year. I think you did it up maybe a couple of times, but it was both teams. I, I, I was 31 on both teams. So just take teams. your pick. Okay. So I, yeah. I remember that time. Now, and I can't argue with you on the 05. I never, I never rode the 05. I, did, I guess I got the late stages of that kind of run of that model. Yeah. Um, and I was coming off of Yamaha and I was just like, God, this, these, this, they figured this thing out. So I, I know you had a lot of success on that generation of a bike. Um, when you do look back, what year would you say would be the one year that you look back and, I mean, let's be honest, every year is going to have high and lows. Your best year, you're going to have some bad ones. Sure. But which one do you go back and go, man, that year was just, I love the team. I love the bike. My results were good. I was healthy. Like what's the year for you? Probably 2006. And it's weird because I just said that I thought the bike took a step backwards, but um, just everything was kind of clicking. Uh, it was the final year, ironically, of the Subway Coca-Cola Honda team, but we had taken so many steps forward organizationally. And I felt like I was uh, the team leader there. And you know, I think people handle pressure differently or expectations differently. Some people, they have a hard time with it and it, it affects them mentally. And I think it forces other people to focus on what they're doing and, and understand that people are reliant upon them to deliver. And I think in that season, I really was able to harness the tools I was given. Uh, I was at the right time in that. I was in that 26 to 27 year old time frame, which a lot of uh, nutritionist and everybody will tell you that's as strong as you're going to get is that that time in your life. And uh, yeah, it was just everything was kind of clicking. Um, I had my best results in Supercross. I think I got 12th in the 450 Supercross series, had some really good results, lots of top tens that season. Uh, and then I had my best uh, motocross result, which was fifth overall at Bud's Creek in that same season. Uh, and it, if anybody ever tries to tell you that getting a top five in an, a pro motocross race isn't a big deal. They are lying to your face uh, because that's a day I'll never forget. Um, I just rode incredibly well and you can't, you can't fake it in Lucas Oil Pro Motocross. You just can't. Um, so yeah, it was just a time where in the moment I thought I was just kind of ramping up. Like it was just, okay, we're still building. But looking back, I think that was probably peak ability and, and everything was probably at the, at the highest point for me. As you get through that stage, that that prime, we would call it that prime age, you start getting towards the end. I, you again, you're analytical. You live in reality. A lot of people can't even see a, a foot in front of them, let alone five, 10 years. And I know you're smarter than that. So you get to that period, you start looking at the end. Is there a, a thought of like, what am I going to do next? Again, you're, you're connected to the industry. So there's maybe going to be some options, but are you looking at it like, man, I'm terrified to be done as a racer or are you starting to look at it like, okay, let's wind this down and let's rev up the next chapter of my life. Use those connections. I feel like some people, it hits them like a ton of bricks and then some maybe like you would, would could see the writing on the wall and start planning your, uh, your next chapter of your life. Is that, did that go for you like that? It, yeah, it, it did, but it wasn't yet. It wasn't, uh, it certainly wasn't in 2006. I yeah, was yeah. Still Not very then. much like Not, ramping yeah. up. Um, you know, and, and there were a lot of things colliding and not necessarily endemic to moto, but if you remember the 2008, 2009, 2010, we went through the financial crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So anytime something like that happens and there are these external crises going on in the world, 
it seems like the first thing that has hit are these leisure activities, which I would consider supercross, motocross, everything with, you know, power sports to be right in there. And money is immediately taken away from that application. Like the resources that are pushed there are immediately withdrawn first. And we felt that uh, I, I'm sure you did as, as a racer. I know I did and teams did uh, contingencies and all the revenue streams that riders had at the time. A lot of those were either reduced or completely removed entirely. So I remember the end of 09, there was that feeling coming, like teams are pulling back, rides are going away, money wasn't as readily available. And then 2010, uh, it, was, it was apparent, like it was yeah. here. And I remember I was doing pretty well in 2010. The tw once I got off the 29 uh, Honda, which I hated that <laughs> bike, and I still hate that bike. I if it was in this room, I would kick it over right here. Um, but I switched to the Suzuki in 2010, and it, w it breathed some life into my racing. The bike was really good and it kind of revitalized a lot of things. I regained a lot of confidence that I lost and I had a good year in 2010, but as good as the year was, I didn't make any money. They're just, Suzuki didn't pay contingency. All of the inside the industry sponsors that were paying per result for Supercross were gone. Like that revenue stream was just entirely gone. And I went from you know, say my revenue or my income was X in 07, 08, even 09 somewhat, I was probably at like 30% of that for 2010 with the same results. Yeah. So no matter who you are that's watching this, if you go into work on Tuesday and you are doing the job, you're whole, wholeheartedly in it, right? All your time. And doing and good and doing good. Right, and doing, right, very you're doing good. a good job. And you go to a job on Wednesday and now you make 30% of what you made on Tuesday. That in and of itself is going to force you to think about what the future holds because you don't want to do that anymore. It's really difficult to keep your heart and soul into something that is now 70% less income yeah. than it was just before that for nothing of your own fault. And you're actually doing better than you were. You're, you're overperforming from what you were the prior year. Um, so that really was, you know, it took two more years for me to step away, but I, the, to your question, I know it's a really long winded answer. To your question, yes, that 2010 season, I started thinking, okay, what's next? And, and it also helped that I just turned 30 and all these things too, right? So there's a lot of confluence there about why you would start to think that. But to me, the financial crisis and the ripple effects through the industry was probably the number one uh, reason for me to start thinking about what's next. Uh, same here. I, I, I made it a little bit longer. Uh, stupidly, I took a couple more injuries, but man, my fair races all went away. Yep. <laughs> it was like, yeah. All my, all the, the juice was gone well, and it was like scary, yeah. super scary. And your, your fair races were my Europe, right? I would go yep. to Europe for seven, eight, 10 races a year. And those went away. All the sponsorship for those races was just gone. So they couldn't afford to pay me to come over. And, and I would speak to the same promoters and they're like, okay, we're going to put a race together but we can't pay you. You're going to be racing for purse and no expense money, which for me coming off, if I had won those races year in and year out, it was a really profitable deal for me, which I'd earned, right? I, I worked my way up into those. Mm -hmm. I wasn't willing to do it like that. Um, maybe, I, maybe I should have, maybe I should have, but I wasn't willing to. And then you don't really realize how bad this financial crisis is going to affect things and for how long similar to yeah. like COVID we're coming out of, like you don't really in the moment, you don't understand what's happening to the world around you. Um, but yeah, those, all that, all that money was just gone. Right. So now you're like, I have a mortgage, I have car payment. I have all these things that were normal. It's normal life. But when you don't make any money anymore, like you start thinking, okay, well, I got to do something here or else I'm going to yeah. be bankrupt and broke and, you know, living on the street. Right. And then the hard decision comes when it's like, OK, let's do this. And for some, maybe opportunities don't pop up. Maybe some they do. I mean, we just had Jacob Hayes on here. I mean, he's in his late 20s and he just got an offer to be an agent in the sport. And yep. the hardest decision ever, because he still is competitive. He could still maybe be a top 10, possibly top five Supercross guy. Sure. And he's got to walk away because financially he's got obligations. So I, I have to imagine that decision was hard for you as well. Um, as you move out of that chapter into that next chapter, 
what kind of options are you looking at? I mean, are you living the life you thought you would say 10 years ago or did things just kind of all of a sudden materialize and you just kind of went with the flow or did you have a kind of a vision of where you wanted to end up? And is that where you're at now? You know, it's funny. So um, the vice president of the company I work for, Western Power Sports, which is of course the parent company for fly racing, vice president, his name is Terry Basley. And a lot of people that are watching this won't know who that is from, I couldn't make up a name and they wouldn't know, but he was instrumental in every step of me coming here. And I remember in that 2010 season, him mentioning, cause he knew I was older, right? I was 30 turning 31. And he was like, Hey, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what your, cause everybody has their own time horizon, right? Jacob Hayes was just now, I'm sure if you asked him a year ago, that wasn't even in the, in the cards, right? He never w- was really considering that. Not even a thought, not even right, a thought. Right. So everybody's time frame is different. And he, and he knew that. So he just said, Hey, no pressure. I don't want the, I think he was worried that I was going to take it like an insult, like, Hey, you need to hang it up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, just when you're ready, we want, we want to talk, right. We want to pursue something with you. And, and I, I took it the right way, thankfully, but I was like, cool. Like, I, I really appreciate that because that day is coming eventually. Right. I, I told you, I was already understanding the way the economy was going and I'm going to have to make a move here eventually. So we started that process in 2010. And it really wasn't until 2012 that I initiated a serious talk about that. Um, I, in 2012, I didn't want to be racing anymore. I, I was still racing and I was full-time and, and I, was, I was putting in the work, but my heart wasn't in it at all anymore. And it was really just a means to an end. It was a way to pay my bills, but I, I wanted out and I wanted out badly. Uh, so I really escalated those talks quickly. And um, yeah, we were all over the map as far as direction with Western Power Sports. How was that going to look? What was I going to do? Uh, was, you know, we really never considered me moving to Boise at the time. We, we were just exploring every avenue, trying to figure out what made sense. Um, but yeah, it was just one of those things where I, once I kind of set my heart on WPS in that 2012 season, it was like, okay, I'm done. I don't want to race anymore after this year. That's a hard stop. Like I, no matter what happens, I'm out. Um, but this Avenue with fly racing, I, you know, I'd been sponsored by them for so long and we had such a, a really deep respect for each other prof- professionally and personally. Um, it was just kind of then finding out how do we move forward? We both wanted to move forward and how do we do that? Nice. And then obviously that worked out good. You're there now. Um, fly has had a lot of success over the last 10 years. Um, I think in you're spite a, of me, you sh- I would say in spite of me, we've had success. <laughs> uh, yeah. But at the same time, a lot, uh, you, you, I'm going to give you a lot of credit whether you like it or not. And I, and I, for a couple of reasons why, number one, you mentioned your analytical, which I know you are, you're very detail oriented. Um, I know you're competitive. We know with Pulp MX fantasy, you flip tables at your own house regularly. So we know there's a competitive streak yep. there. You take that competitiveness with your analytics and the way you look at things to a brand that is obviously competitive, trying to be the absolute best it can be every year, never satisfied. Uh, Looking back now, do you find this to be like the perfect landing spot for you? Because you have been a part of that. And it's not just you. It's the people. I know the whole group around you. They're all the same. Uh, Do you feel like that was a good landing spot for you? Because you could take your personality and drive it home with this brand and help it get to where it is now, which is, again, one of the one, if maybe the best gear company in the entire sport. It was the perfect fit. Uh, You know, this company is built by and it's still made up of enthusiasts and former racers. Um, You look, you know, Terry, who hired me, was a racer. Uh, My mentor, when they put me in my role, uh, Bob Lowry, he was a former racer, right? the person I work side by side with today. And we, in essence, run the fly racing brand together. Now, Cole Siebler is a former pro supercross racer. You look at our rep force out across America, we have guys like Brock Sellards and Jeff Northrup, and you just go down the list and it's racer after racer after racer. And I believe that becomes a company-wide mentality where you've been raised one way. You race, you compete, you want to be the best, Every morning, your first thought is, how am I going to be better at this today? And that was racing for everybody for a long time. But once you find a way to channel that same mentality towards we're building a brand and we're building a company as Western Power Sports as a whole, that's a really powerful movement to have on your side. And I attribute a lot of the success and the growth 
and just the kind of the come up of both Western Power Sports and Fly Racing to that, we want to win. And it's a different application, but the mindset of like, we want to be the best. And what does it take to be the best? Fine, we'll do that. Like, just tell us what we have to do to be better. And we don't care. We have to work 20 hours a day, done, right? We want to be better. And uh, I think that just bleeds over into the results over time, right? It takes time, but you start to see that show up in yeah. market share and brand reputation and the quality of the products that we have to offer too. Yeah, it's been quite a ride. I, I, I'm going to take a shot at fly racing right now, but that gear that Eric Nye wore at Loretta Lynn's back in the day that had a bunch of brown in it. Hey, I was wearing it those days. Like I, <laughs> so I am, I am in a perfect place to understand what it was and, and what, what it is. is. Yeah. <laughs> what and, and, and I think Terry, like, I, I think I offend Terry, uh, who are, is a vice president, as I mentioned, but fly racing was his idea. Okay. So he was drawing designs of fly racing on a napkin in Asia. This is how it started of like, this is what I want. Right. So I think I offend him at times when I take shots at it in the office too, but I, I'm not trying to. I'm, it's right. more of like, hey, look at you're not a, you are you are not a designer, and he knows that he is not a graphic designer. Yeah, okay? but look at the seed the seed that he right. planted, and look at it now. So, so if he takes offense to his graphic designs that he drew on a napkin, you, that's on you. Like I, I okay, like we have we're using CAD and all these crazy you know Photoshop and Illustrator and all these things now to create insanely great looks right now it's okay that we weren't in a good place 20 years ago but all of this is a testament to the foresight that you had the relentlessness that you showed when you got told no over and over and over um to now build a brand that is is truly global and and you know you look at the partnerships we've created with with feld and with with supercross and everywhere right we're a part of virtually every series whether it's off-road or motocross on earth uh and, and the crazy thing is i think we're we're still just getting started like i i talk to people around here and i look at the opportunities that are on the forefront and i, I don't think we're anywhere near what the potential is yeah it's still it seems like it's still revving up i mean i know this is silly and a little off topic but you told me a while back wait till you see the new kids gear that's coming out and dude I, i'll show when i showed my son he flipped out and it shows that you guys are still innovating in, in different ways. Having one specific set of kids gear that is all like drunk. I mean, it just, it really, it nailed it. So it does seem like you guys are still evolving and finding ways to get in all the niches and make sure you satisfy all the customers. Again, you got my kid all freaked out over that, that and, new line. And, so. and it's, it's the, such a subjective thing um, to expect everyone to like all the things that you're doing is right. my goal but it's probably foolish and I probably take it too personally when someone's like, eh, I don't like it or it's too boring or it's too out there or whatever. And, and I always try to defend it and I come flying in hot and I, I shouldn't, <laughs> I, I should just absorb it and understand that that's what tastes are. Uh, and, but we're also very lucky that the brand has grown to a place where we can offer all kinds of things. We, we right. offer different styles and graphics and colors and cuts and fits. And if you want to be, really clean looking we have this and if you want to step out and look like no one else okay well we have that um so it's just one of those things where i sh it's probably my biggest struggle is to take criticism well because i i understand the work and the thought and the careful process that went behind it and i also feel like you're insulting us as a brand you're really not it's just not for you like that particular yeah. looking color is not for you and, and that's totally fine i need to do a better job of that um, but maybe at the same time, that would show I was losing my passion for it, too. So maybe I just need to go all in, just push it all in and, and just flip out anytime somebody says they don't. Yeah, like don't, don't cool off. <laughs> Heat up. Just yeah. start flip, flip them tables, JT. Just end up on um, the news. I'll just end up on the news. Like somebody <laughs> made one snide comment. I just lost my mind. Uh, that's going on right now in the world a lot. So uh, you'd fit right in with everybody. Yeah. Um, so in this lane, crushing it, doing great, but knowing you again, that's not enough. Um, your analytical, your coverage of the sport in the, especially the podcast world where I'm going to go with this. Um, you're very unique as far. And we had an argument about this like a week ago. So this will be good to air it out. You're on the review show, the racetracks review show with Mathis and Weege, yeah. my favorite show. Love it. 
Um, you go on Pulp every week, but you have your podcast, Industry Seating, which again, I like because it's just you breaking down in your own words without interruption, without Steve hassling you from some weird angle. Um, you're covering the sport in a lot of different ways. Just kind of take me through the process of you as an individual watching the sport, being involved on the business side with Fly, but then feeling like you need to expand on the way you cover it, the way the things you're seeing and delivering those messages in all the different formats you do. Um, why is that part of you so important um, outside of just your business responsibilities, but being able to cover the sport your way? Well, you know, all those shows are, are a lot of fun. Um, that, that's mostly why I started doing them. You know, it wasn't for financial reasons or, you know, I started doing the Pulp MX show long before I worked at Fly. And, and I just enjoyed bench racing with Steve on the show. That's really what it came down to. Uh, and those have morphed, you know, expanded shows and, and uh, the race recap is, is my favorite one to do as well. I think that Jason Wygant and myself and Steve all have a, a really nice chemistry and we all have different viewpoints and perspectives, which, yeah, sometimes we uh, disagree <laughs> if, you, if you've ever picked up on that. Yeah, um, a little bit. Yeah, but, you know, my podcast that I started last year, I just wanted something that I was really steering the ship on. Because those other shows, whether it's Pulp Show or The Recap or whatever, fantasy shows, whatever we're doing, Steve is really kind of guiding us through topics and deciding when we're going to move on and things like that. But this was one that I, I could talk about things I wanted to talk about. If I just wanted to talk about one incident that happened on the track for an hour, I can. There's, uh, I could go for five hours on one topic if I wanted to. There's no one to tell me to cut it off or stop or we need to take a commercial break or anything. And I can, I can have my own take and I can... I can cover it in every aspect that I want to and really dive deep into a certain thing if I want to. And if it's not interesting to someone else, that's okay. That, but that's what I wanted. I just wanted my own voice. And it took me a long time to get to that point because it, it's ironic, but you know, Steve in 2012 and 2013, he was really encouraging me to start my own podcast. He wanted me to do it. I didn't want to, I wasn't ready. I didn't really feel like I'd found my voice yet and I just didn't want to take it on. And after a decade of doing these shows, you know, cause we've been doing the Pulp Mech show for a decade together. I felt like it was a time and, and I had grown into it enough and I felt comfortable enough in my own skin to just, I can just ramble for 45 minutes on my own. Right. And I have my topics that I want to cover that I've, I've you know, written my notes and, and cursive as you would, you would probably think handwritten wrote them down right exactly handwritten yeah. <laughs> um but i think it was it took me a long time to get to the point where i was ready and I, I don't think there was any sort of uh known process that i was going to it wasn't like okay one day i'm gonna wake up it was just like you know what i think i'm ready to do this i want to have my own voice and i want to do something that is my baby and i can grow it or I can keep it mellow, or I can just stop if I want to. You know, I'm not letting anyone down at that point. Uh, so it, it's been a really fun experience. It's been a learning curve for me. Um, I remember my first few, you know, you talk, try talking to yourself straight for 45 minutes. It, it's not the easiest thing in the world no. to do. You have these awkward pauses, and I think it's forced me to grow uh, in that space as a podcaster. That's a kind of a new term. It's crazy where we are in these days, but um yeah it's forced me to really work on my craft which is not my real job but i really really enjoy it and uh yeah if you look around man that that space is exploding so can't hurt why not what one of the hard things i think in this sport and again I, it's like the big debate right are we like a really big little sport or are we a really little big sport we're kind of in this weird space right yep. where you and i come into contact with the athletes all the time. I mean, it's part of the, it's, it's part of the club. We, we, we see the writers yet in media, you have to be honest. You have to give honest opinions. Um, you get hit for that sometimes by writers, even your own writers at fly racing might yeah. be mad at you from time to time. How, how do you, because I mean, this is hard battle for me too, with what I do as far as being on the broadcast podcasting and then being friends with some of the writers, how do you balance being honest not holding back, but understanding that we are in a small enough group where these people, we see them and they're going to see you next week and they're going to have something to say about what you said. But at the same time, you can't cover when something's obvious and it has to be said from your take. How do you, are you just, I guess, naturally gifted at knowing that fine line? Because I think you ride it perfectly. Or does it take some conscious effort for you to make sure you ride that line where you're honest 
to your audience because you have to be. But at the same time, you have to be a little harsh on guys that you're going to have to see on Saturday that might not like hearing what you have to say. It is tough. Uh, and I, I'll be fair and say I do hold back sometimes uh, because I do have a professional responsibility. Uh, you know, if I went off on a rider for riding terribly or doing something ill-advised, took somebody out or a bad decision or whatever, and then in that same breath, I knew that we wanted to hire that rider for 2022 and beyond. I have to be careful. And mm -hmm. it's not always the easiest dynamic to weave through. Um, but I think the most important thing for riders to understand is when, whether it's Steve or myself or pick your favorite podcast or analyst or whoever, they are critiquing their performance. They're not critiquing you. They're not critiquing mm -hmm. your family or your personality or anything. It's that move, that performance, that moto, how you rode that day. And I think there is a distinct difference there because just because like Zach Osborne, right? Great fly racing rider, champion, someone we've really, you know, dove into and, and really pushed as far, hard as we can to be an ambassador for fly racing. He does everything right. He's had some bad days. You know, he's, he's injured in the moment. He's had bad rides in the past. And when I talk to him, I'm like, hey, if I say something about you didn't ride well today, you are still everything we want in a but I, ha I have to in this podcast i have to say you didn't ride very well you have, yeah you can't be so obviously uh, yeah. jaded you have to tell the truth yep. sometimes and that yep. can suck yeah and and I'll, i will text those guys or i'll speak to them privately and say hey i it's not that i don't like you like but in your heart of hearts in five years you're going to look back and say yeah i was not very good that day right and, and you're going to the emotion is going to be removed from it so it's it's not always the easiest thing um there are guys that are get angry with with me, and and I feel like I'm, I really try to be careful where other guys go in hard, and, and I really try to not do that. Um, but even guys guys have been angry with me in the past, Christian Craig and Cameron McAdoo, and guys have been upset with things I've said. But I always just try to remind them, like, hey, like McAdoo, perfect example. I was saying he needed to back it down a little bit in Supercross and stay off the ground and like you're just over the edge a touch. And that's why these things are happening. And he wasn't thrilled with that at all. But I also was saying like, I love the way this kid goes about things. He's professional, he's courteous, he's respectful. I love all those things. I just think these crashes are going to end poorly if you don't back it down a little bit. And I just hope that riders one day, and, and if they don't in the moment, that's okay. But one day they're gonna look back and say, it wasn't a personal attack. It was just, analyzing their performance it's just what we're there to do that is part of that it's literally why we're there and why we're talking about it is to dissect what we saw why we think they did it and maybe how they can improve on it in the future i think the riders do come around proof being the relationships that have been mended by steve yeah absolutely. i mean he's had davy Millsap's co-host uh in his home totally. ricky carmichael on the show carmichael on the show you're welcome yep. Steve. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like the riders do come around, but don't you feel like in the moment when their career is everything to them, you're, they know that your voice travels and hearing yep. that it probably recognizing that what you're saying is true, but maybe not liking it told by someone like you, who's articulate and can get it out. So right. It probably yep. is just like, God, I don't like when JT goes at me because he says it right and clear. And their whole world is at that moment where they get past it and they go, man, I was a little loose back then. And he was right. So I, I think you're right. And, and forgive me for asking this question if you don't want to answer, but have you ever had a rider where they were really mad, like really had a problem or is it more like, bro, come on, lighten up. I think so. They haven't ever addressed me about it. Um, but I'm sure, I'm sure like behind closed doors, they weren't happy. Um, and not, this wasn't the case, but I'll give you another example. Uh, so I do a uh, power rankings, which Supercross Live does as well, right? We have a Supercross mm -hmm. power rankings. I do a power rankings in my podcast, which for me is really more. Oh man, you're yeah, playing with fire. Right? With that. Totally. Why are you doing that? <laughs> but it's really more for me as a jumping off point because I'll say, okay, uh, whoever, um, Adam Cincerillo is number six. And then I will jump into the points and the notes I have made about him, but it's more of someone to keep me on track of what I have to say about that guy. Well, a perfect example, Christian Craig has been really solid this Lucas Oil promotor cross season. Okay. Well, he's also racing 250 supercross and I 
don't really put 250 Supercross guys in my power rankings because I feel like there's too much ground to be made up from all the 450 Supercross guys. Well, Connor Fields, who thankfully is doing uh, much better after his Olympic crash, uh, spoke with him the morning of this interview and uh, just- Oh, very, he's very, better? Yeah, yeah, I was so really, I saw his number pop up on my phone and I was like running, like I was like, couldn't yeah. open my phone fast enough uh, to, to reach back out to him. And, you know, he works with Christian very closely and he was giving me a hard time. I was like, Christian's not happy. I'm not happy. Like, and it wasn't a real serious tone, but you could tell like they were getting offended that they weren't getting into those. And I'm like, for one, you got to calm down. These power rankings are ridiculous by me. Like this is me sitting on my laptop watching, you know, I'm watching reruns doing this. It's for the fans, man. Totally. It's for the, it's for the fans. Chill. If you're taking these to heart, stop because they mean nothing. They're literally, I could flip them upside down and just be like, ah, whatever. Like it doesn't matter. Um, but that's a perfect example is like something that I take for totally for granted, like where I place these guys, like Christian felt slighted and he shouldn't because he's been riding exceptionally well. And he did get in the power rankings after, uh, Washugal, by the way. So I'll, you know, he, I think he <laughs> so, so calm down, a little you're in there. bit. I think him leaning on me a little bit forced my hand. <laughs> ah, did, okay. That stuff does happen. People take that stuff to heart and they really shouldn't. Because in the end, we're, we're kind of morons. Like, we, we know what we're talking about to an extent, but our opinion is not the gospel. It's just one person's opinion of a particular race. And it's subject to change. You go out and do incredibly well at the next race. Guess what? We're going to be singing your praises. Like, that's just how this Yeah, this there's goes. short memory in this sport. Yep. You can suck forever. You have one good weekend. We're all about you guys. Look, just look go at, have a good weekend. You're yeah. good. Look at stick and ball sports. Those guys are the kings of Monday morning. You're either the worst player on earth or the best player on earth. And then a week from then, they could totally flip-flop. Like there is no long-term memory of any of this stuff, right? It's it's exactly what you showed us on Saturday or Sunday, and that's all we remember. Funny story. Chris, I feel bad for Christian. Hopefully he's not watching or Connor Field is not watching this because <laughs> I got a Christian story for you. Uh, he was on pulp after the first round in Houston when he won. And I was on and he called me out for talking bad about him on my podcast and i'm and i'm think i'm shocked because i actually called him to win the title like six months before the season started just in one of my you know how i am jp I, yeah i yep. throw things out so he's calling me out and saying yeah i heard your podcast heard what you said and it was motivating and blah 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 and i got the win and i'm like so do i send you an invoice or what it sounds like i motivated <laughs> right you. It sounds yep. like i was the driving force behind your victory and the funny part is, is me and Christian are totally cool now. I talked to his wife. I, I've been very supportive of him in situations where I don't think he was being treated fairly, but I was just being honest. And again, it's funny how this sport, though, you and I, we can say something and then we have to face these guys. We're in stick and ball sports. You know, if you're, um, you know, Stephen A. Smith, you can throw it out there and you don't have to deal with these guys face to face where we do have to play a weird little dancing game sometimes because... Dude, well, we got to see him on Saturday, you know? And, and I, you know, I, I used to watch those shows a lot. You know, when, when you're racing, you have a lot of downtime because you're, you're working hard, but you also need to recover too. Like the recovery part, especially during the motocross season is, is almost as important, if not more than all the work you're putting in. So for me, that relaxation recovery, I would be watching uh, these Skip Bayless type shows and whatever. And I listen to him and I'm like, how can you ever face that person? The things are coming out of your mouth. And I guess <laughs> they don't have to, right? Because they don't. if I said something like that, like I would be like watching my back every step of walking around the races. But I think that's just the level of accountability we have to have where those guys just go as, as incredibly hard of an angle as they can possibly find. It's like, oh, there's our ratings. We'll, we'll get it. But for me, I want, I want accountability. I want credibility. And if I am ever going to say something on any podcast or any show ever, I would want to be able to say that to that person's face. And that's yeah. when it really comes down to it. That's my number one rule is I don't say anything behind someone's back, especially publicly that I wouldn't say if they were sitting right across from me. And, and I think if you follow that and you really believe that, it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. Uh, and it's fair and it's respectful that you're, again, you believe in what you're saying, but you would say it to them and you don't ever yep. cross the line where those other, those big shows and the big sports, I think the whole thing is to cross the line. That's what gets yeah. those ratings up. And again, you're not sitting on a set somewhere looking to drive up your ratings and never having to face these guys. You know you have to. So you're kind of in this 
you're kind of doing two jobs at once. Well, you're doing multiple, but you know what I mean? You're having to play multiple roles in the media. So you can't just sit behind a camera and just crush people and then be like, I would never want to, I would never want to be that person anyway. I I just, to me, they're, they're clowns. Like they're really putting on an act. It's just entertainment. Like it's not It's entertainment. It is. It's not real analysis. Like it's show me one reason why Skip Bayless should ever be able to critique an NFL quarterback. Like I'll, I'll wait, <laughs> right. I'll, I'll wait. Um, but I mean, that's he's buff, do. dude. Haven't you yeah. seen him? He's right. He's and that's fine. Buff. I'm not saying he's not good at what he does, but for anyone to be taking those guys seriously is you're yeah, they're going for, they're, they're going for jaw dropping comments. That's what they want. Right. That's why they're on TV. Some of them are fun. <laughs> it is entertaining. <laughs> and I'm just like, whoo. Um, so close this thing down. I got two more questions for you. This is beyond the track. We've been uh, talking inside the industry a lot, but I want to talk about uh, you really quickly as we end the show uh, or this episode. Beyond the track, I know that you're into other things outside of racing. You like football. I'm a dire football fan. I have to imagine you're fired up to get this thing going. Like I love football season for me. It just feels different. Yeah. And then also, um, I know that you've been studying financials. You've been getting up early and knowing yeah. you, it just fits so well. <laughs> Take me beyond the track a little bit. Like if, if, if dirt bikes are not involved in your hour or six hours or day, what is Jason Thomas doing? So I've been on this uh, crusade and really ever since, you know, the, the world started suffering from COVID and, and there was just so much more free time on everybody's hands, you know, forced on us. You know, for me, I went to college for almost two years while I was racing professionally too. And then I, I progressed to a place where, okay, I had to choose. And then I never went back. So I always felt like I left a lot on the table as far as educationally and bettering myself on that end. And so I was just like, okay, screw it. I'm going to take this free time and I'm going to learn, right? I'm going to, okay, first research, what do I need to be learning and how can I go about that without actually going to a classroom? Because, you know, thankfully the internet's such a powerful tool. You can, you can find any information you'd ever want uh, with a few keystrokes or a few, you can write it down as if, Daniel, you can write it. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I've been doing that for, yeah, year and a half now, almost. Um, I get up early, you know, before I would really need to be fulfilling any fly racing obligations. And I'm studying uh, to be more financially literate, to understand how the economy works, understand um, external factors, all these uh, conditions that, you know, why do things happen? Because it's very easy to be reactive. And you say, this happened and yeah, okay, well, that's why. But if you, if you really understand the process and you go back through history and say, okay, there was this catalyst or this event happened and then there were all these effects that happened because of it, I think you start to be, under, be able to understand as you're watching the news or you're watching events unfold, like we're, you know, we're starting to deal with this Delta variant and the world is starting to deal with more lockdowns, okay? So what, how is the world going to be affected by that? Who's going to be immediately affected financially, shortages, labor, all those things, which do affect my fly racing job. But in the end, they just make me smarter. They make me more equipped to be a better person, to deal with my financial life uh, and to just make better decisions and kind of know what's coming. And I don't think you're ever going to be in a bad position by being smarter and just being more able to understand the world around you. And uh, it really stems from, I think, motocross is you get tunnel vision. You know, you're worried about one thing. And every day I got up and I was only worried about how to be a better motorcycle rider and racer, right? Whether that was fitness or nutrition or riding or whatever, they're all in the same avenue, right? And none of the other life experiences are really gained because you're only worried about this one thing. So I've really tried to take this opportunity and take the time to, okay, what did I miss out on? What were all these other, you know, going to uh, a finance class in school or, or these classes that somebody would be taking, getting their MBA or, or whatever, how can I at least try to close the gap on that, on the knowledge that I would have gained doing those things? And it's really just being a better person, right? And, and when I'm called upon in my real job at Fly Racing to make a very informed decision globally, and that's dealing with, okay, timeframes of products coming in and how are, uh, if China goes back into full lockdown, how's that going to affect any of our business relations with them or Southeast Asia or Europe or any of those things? 
understanding the dynamics behind it are going to be, allow me to make a wiser decision. And if, if that's it alone, if that's the only thing I gain, then, then that's totally worth it. Uh, I just, I want to be a smarter person in the end. That's awesome. I, I, are you still having fun with it? Cause I mean, I, 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 I yeah, that's what and, drives you into it, true, right? Is, yes. is, is interest. Are you still intrigued as you it get truly going deeper? interests me. Um, and, and I think that's probably the biggest driver. If it was painful, if I hated it and I was just grinding, there's no way I could force myself up at two or three in the morning, which is what I'm doing. You know, I haven't been up on a, maybe on a weekend or something at a race, but I haven't been up since past like 3 15 AM in a year. Um, so it's usually in the two o'clock hour I'm up. So from like two to six 30, I'm reading, watching. I mean, there's so many useful Dang. tools out there, whether it's YouTube or actually reading books or whatever, I'm just trying to absorb information and you don't really understand in the moment, but I look back a year ago at my knowledge base of these things and I'll watch a show. And I, a year ago, I'd be like, don't know what that means. I don't know what that word he says. I couldn't even repeat it if I had to. And now I'm watching it and I'm just following along and you start to be like, okay, he's leading into this topic, right? He just said that mm -hmm. because he's going to steer us towards this of what he thinks is going to happen globally. And that's just the evolution of it. that's, uh, you know, I, I didn't get to finish college. So I'm kind of forcing my way through it the best way I know how. You're going to have to make sure your Sundays are open though, because football is starting. Yep. Um, last well, last they don't question. Play. Well, they don't play football at, at three in the morning, thankfully. So I still have that window. It, does, it actually doesn't affect <laughs> uh, your football, but I have to imagine you'd be tired by Sunday night football. So, yeah, last question, just for fun. Uh, and I know you hate this, but predictions for the NFL season. Let's just hear it. Who's going <laughs> to the bowl? Well, uh, Cowboys will be disappointed. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't ask, but what, what, what? I mean, that was oh, what I, you wanted. That was, that was what I you wanted. You think I wanted to bring up them? I'd want to bring up them. I'm, I'm asking who's going to win. I didn't ask who's going to disappoint and destroy someone emotionally for the next six months. That's not what I asked. Uh, no. I asked who's going to win. You know what? There's so much parody uh, in the sport now, but I think the, the strengths will still be the strengths. I think, uh, you know, the Chiefs will be tough. Um, I think that the Bucks will be pretty strong again, but I, I think the process they went through last year was pretty miraculous because they weren't good at the beginning of the year at all, mm -hmm. where I think you'll see the chiefs are going to be good from the first game to the last game. Um, but you know, it's, it's an interesting time because they're in camp right now. And you always have to think that the most critical aspect of any team is injury. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter if you have the best team on paper that could ever be assembled. If you can't stay healthy, none of it really matters. Um, your team can be completely torn apart in a, in a week if you lose two offensive linemen, right? That's, look at the Cowboys last year, right? Their offensive linemen went down. And, and I, I don't, I'm, that's not anybody's fault, but you lose one critical piece of a team and then, yeah, you're, you're done. Um, so uh, yeah. Or, or, or is, the owner, or the owner could think he's a GM. <laughs> Well, I, I think if you would just let Steven do the work, they'd be fine. No, huh? no, no. He's worse. Stop it. I know. I just uh, okay, so it, <laughs> Bucks Chiefs probably would be the money. Who's the challenger? Give me the two biggest challengers, AFC, NFC, and we'll close it up. I think, uh, I think the Bills need to, to be watched. Um, I'm still waiting to see if the Browns can break out, though, because if you look at the Browns on paper and you don't – if you looked at the team without their colors or name on them, you'd be like – how are these guys going to get beat? But then you look at, they're the Browns and you're like, oh yeah, that's how, because they're the Browns. Mm -hmm. So I'm waiting for them to put it all together. Uh, but yeah, I mean, right now, if I had to choose, I would say the Chiefs. Uh, I think they've retooled their offensive line a bit and you look at the rest of their team and, and it's lights out. I mean, they can, they can outscore anybody as long as Mahomes doesn't have to run 25 miles in one game, side to sideline to sideline to escape defenders. Uh, I think they'll be really, really difficult to beat. So Bills challenged the Chiefs, and then Bucks brought back their entire starting lineup on the offense and defense, I'm, I think. Um, they're obviously going to be good. Who's the challenger in the NFC? Uh, I want to see if the 49ers um, – 49ers NFC? I don't yep. know. I, I, don't, I never – I get confused with the AFC NFC, but uh, I think the 49ers have a chance. Um, you know, last year injuries just killed them. Um, you know, they, they brought in Trey Lance. I, I don't know how that's going to go. Uh, I'm not the biggest Garoppolo fan in the world, but I think that Kyle Shanahan is absolutely a, an offensive genius. Uh, he is. Look at the, the schemes and things he comes up with. 
And for you to be able to run for 300 plus yards in a, in a NFL game, it doesn't make any sense. And, and NFL with, with running backs that nobody's heard, heard of, of. Of. right? Yeah. And as a defensive coordinator, you probably have to be pulling your hair out because all they're going to do is run right, run left, run middle. And I cannot stop it. I can't do anything about this. So to be able to execute that is that's genius to be able to scheme that. So I, I'm really looking for uh, the 49ers to kind of have a bounce back year, but I, I will qualify that by saying that I can't, his name escapes me. They lost their defensive coordinator who was, kind of a mad scientist in his own right. Uh, so we'll see yeah. if they can, they can fill that gap. The jet, he's the jets coach. I forget yes. his name too. He's yeah, the yeah, jets yeah, head coach. Yep. Um, all right. Well, for all the moto lovers right there, sorry for that, but I just That's had to ask right. JT because I love football. I know you like football. It's going to be fun. Yep. Uh, but thanks for coming on beyond the track with me again, been wanting to do this for a long time, but the fly drop happened. I knew it would be better right after. So uh, congratulations on the launch. Congratulations on everything you're doing with media and the podcast world. And uh, JT, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on beyond the track. Yeah. Thanks guys. Thanks for the opportunity.